Thank you, and, and I want to make this very informal. So I will allow questions throughout the talk. So if we have to cut them short, we will, but I just would, you know, as I, as I go through some things, if you have questions, please feel free to ask and uh, join in any discussion because I think that's, that's, that's better for the audience as opposed to me just standing here and, and lecturing. Um, but the first thing I would like to really go over is some of you may not even know what a pediatric urologist is. Um, pediatric, obviously, I take care of children. Uh, but as a urologist, I take care of the uh, genitourinary tract, and that includes urinary tract, um, includes the kidney, all the way to the urethra. So I take care of structural anomalies of the urinary tract, kidney, ureter, bladder, urethra, basically the plumbing system of the body. In addition, I take care and do uh, surgery on the genital and reprodu reproductive tract. Um, that includes, in females, ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, vagina. So that just gives you a little overview of what I do. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about Turner syndrome because I think everybody in this room pretty much knows uh, that that uh, what that is. But I, the history of it was a little interesting to me because I never really looked into the history. Um, it was first described in 1938 by Henry Turner, but it was 20 years before anybody figured out why the syndrome occurred. So in 1959, it was discovered that it was actually due to a missing X chromosome. Um, there's only as you know, well, there can be variants of that in pure gonadal dysgenesis or 45X, you only have one X chromosome. Now, you can also have what we call mosaicism, which you can have some other, um, some other X chromosome material present, or in rare cases, you can actually have Y chromosome material present, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, further. And just for just in case you wondered, normal karyotypes are 46XY for males, 46XX for females. So the absent X chromosome is what defines Turner syndrome. Um, the four classic features you're aware of, um, uh, female, short stature, lack of secondary sexual characteristics, which again is due to ovarian failure, and we'll get to that a little bit further and then a variety of, a variety of somatic abnormalities. Somatic meaning other organ systems. I'll specifically be talking about the urinary tract. Um, occurs in 1 in 2,500 live births, so it's rare, but not horribly rare. Um, Turner syndrome accounts for 10% of spontaneous miscarriages, um, and only 3% of effective fetuses, fetuses actually survive to term. So that's actually a pretty impressive number there. Um, I just alluded to the fact that there is a variety of chromosome makeup. 50% um, of people with Turner syndrome have the pure form of 46X karyotype in all their cells. About 25% will have an abnormal second arm of the X chromosome, which means you have a complete X chromosome and then an abnormal second X chromosome. And then 20% um, are mosaic. 10 to 15% are the 45X, 46XX variety. 2 to 5% are the 45X, 46XY variety. And that's the one we're here to talk about, really, because that's the uh, karyotypic mosaicism that is most at risk. So let's talk about the urinary tract first. Um, this is obviously, for those of you don't, who don't know, a diagram of the urinary tract. The kidneys actually filter the blood and make the urine. The urine is then passed down this tube called a ureter, emptied into the bladder where it is stored until the bladder fills. When the bladder's full, we go to the bathroom and the urine comes out the urethra. Roughly half of the patients with Turner syndrome have a kidney abnormality. And that's significant only if other issues arrive, arise. 
10%, the classic Turner syndrome finding is what's called a horseshoe kidney, but actually only 10% of patients have that. Um, 20% have what we call a duplication anomaly or an absent kidney where only one kidney develops. And about 15% have what we call a malrotation of the kidney where the kidney, the kidneys normally sit in the body like this, but if they're, but a malrotation is they can, they can be tilted like this or rotated anteriorly like that. It's just a, an interesting x-ray picture, but doesn't really have any uh, real implications for uh, any clinical problems. So a horseshoe kidney is basically what it's called. It's where the two kidneys are actually joined at the bottom and form a horseshoe shape. The difference in a horseshoe kidney and a normal kidney is that they are anteriorly rotated a little bit and the ureters come off the front of the kidney instead of coming off the side of the kidney. Um, really the only significance of a, of a horseshoe kidney from my standpoint in terms of what, what, how we have to address them is that they, they can be very challenging to operate on from a surgical standpoint. So you can see that a horseshoe kidney can have a variety of, um, of arteries, veins, the ureters come off in an abnormal position, and so when I, have, when I have to do surgery on a horseshoe kidney, I have to be very careful to identify all these sort of anomalous uh, findings um, because um, it's not like operating on a normal kidney where you know exactly where um, all the blood vessels and the ureter is. So, uh, sorry, that's backwards. A duplication anomaly, which actually occurs more frequently than horseshoe kidney, is what we see right here. We see that there are actually two halves of one kidney, an upper part, which has its own ureter, and a lower part, which has its own ureter. And this is sort of a, um, uh, just an of, of interesting x-ray that shows um, the ureters coming off of a horseshoe kidney anteriorly. I, don't, I thought that was a duplication, but that doesn't really look like one. So pay attention to this picture. Um, the um, issue with all of these um, anomalies of the kidney are not so much the position, but more what can happen, what can go wrong when you have this abnormal anatomy. And remember I said earlier, most of the time, nothing goes wrong. Most of the time, if you have a horseshoe kidney or even a duplication anomaly, nothing really happens. Um, you live a long, healthy, happy life with no kidney abnormalities whatsoever. Now, that being said, there is a slightly higher risk of what we call a UPJ obstruction. And that is where you have a congenital or birth anomaly where the renal pelvis meets the ureter, and this is an obstruction which actually blocks the kidney from draining. That can damage the kidney. It's fixable with surgery, but it is something that can cause damage to the kidney and needs to be addressed. Um, but again, it's not very common. Um, the other issue with horseshoe kidneys and with uh, renal duplications it's what we call vesicoureteral reflux. That is where the urine comes down the ureter, enters the bladder, but then when the bladder squeezes to urinate, the urine backs up into the kidney. And it can be low grade, grade one, or very high grade, where you see a very dilated, tortuous ureter, um, which, can, um, which is actually the worst form of reflux. The problem with reflux is that it can lead to a higher incidence of urinary tract infections, kidney infections, and problems. Uh, um, the reflux isn't what causes the problem. It's actually the infection that can lead to damage of the kidney. So horseshoe kidneys, uh, ureteral duplications, all have a higher incidence of UPJ obstruction and vesicoureteral reflux. And so... Um, that being said, the, um, 
Um, those are things you need to worry about. So infection, recurrent urinary tract infections are what are going to be your signal that something may actually be wrong with the kidney. So um, does that all make sense? Does anybody have questions about any of that? Sure. It's behind you there. Gentleman in the blue shirt. Probably not going to be a problem. That's going to be something that that if if um, if you have um, if you if you have it, you're born with it, and you're going to have problems with it usually pretty early. Now, if you've never had a problem and you've never had a kidney X-ray, and you're 12 and you have a urinary tract infection and you get a X-ray, it's possible to find it at that point. But if you've had an X-ray in the past that was normal, probably not going to come out of the blue. Right. Same, same thing. When my daughter was diagnosed three years ago, she had the scan that she had hyperphenosis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and the doctor didn't really know what to do. She was rescanned a few months later, six months later, and I think it was either mild or absent at the time. Her kidneys looked normal. They said only if she's getting UTIs. Like, is there any follow up? Could that have been a one off for hyperphenosis? Like, is there. So, I was getting, somebody just asked me before I started talking about kidney stones. and. Yes, kidney stone formation is at a higher risk. Um, but hydronephrosis, non-obstructed hydronephrosis is actually a, can be a problem. And if they find that on an ultrasound or a scan, they will usually do another test called a renogram to make sure that it's not an obstruction. Because, I mean, you think about, you think about a, a sink in an old house. You turn the water on, the sink fills up, doesn't drain very well, but you turn the water off, it eventually all drains, right? So it's a slow drain. It's not a blocked drain. So that's what non-obstructive hydronephrosis is. It's a slow drain, but not an obstructed drain. Does that make sense? So if they scan six months later and it wasn't there, does she still need a renogram? Probably not. The ultrasound will get worse if it's obstructed because that fluid's going to continue to build. Only if they have an abnormality. If they have a normal kidney, they don't need to have scans every year. If they have hydronephrosis, then yeah, we want to watch it yearly probably to make sure it doesn't worsen over time. But it's usually the hydronephrosis. So if you have an, a, an obstruction, a UPJ obstruction, that hydronephrosis is going to be impressive. It's going to be a very dilated abnormal kidney. If you have non-obstructive hydronephrosis, it's going to be dilated. You're going to have a little extra fluid in the kidney, but it's going to look different than a UPJ obstruction. Yes, ma'am. Um, I mean, I, unless you've had a problem, I don't think there's any reason for routine imaging. It's just like anybody else that has a kidney. Um, you know, as, as you age, if you get hematuria, if you get pain, if you get infection, if you get, then yes, absolutely, you should be imaged. Now, I will go back to the kidney stone situation. Kidney stone formation is not a, a, um, result of the Turner syndrome itself. It's more a result of slow drainage of the kidney. As I was talking about, if you have a horseshoe kidney and you have obstructive hydronephrosis, the slow drainage of that urine can sometimes cause calcium particles to not pass through fast enough. Then they can sit in the kidney, accumulate, and get a kidney stone. But that's more from the drainage of the kidney, not necessarily from any metabolic problem from the Turner syndrome. Yes. I have a question. If you have somebody that can't be healthy, are you a higher risk of getting a stone? If you have what? If you have somebody in your family that has kidney yes, stones. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The number one risk of kidney stones is family history of kidney stones. Yeah. What, what 
what about if you have to take extra, if your doctor says, well, your Turner's, your, you know, the estrogen has been not, is not the normal double X stuff, and we want you to take calcium in fairly good amounts. It's, yep. I mean, that's a risk. That's a kidney stone risk. Yeah, I mean, but if your family hasn't seen, if you don't see much, if you haven't seen any of it in the family for generations. Probably not going to be an issue. But, you know, kidney stones are, are, are something that if you have, you're going to know it. Because you're going <laughs> to... And so it's not something that is, number one, it's not life-threatening. They're more, they're literally, I like to say, they're a pain. Because that's what they are, literally. They're not. They're just a pain. They're not really a uh, a life threatening problem. Because when you get them, boom, you know you've got them. You go to the doctor and you get them dealt with. Um, but um, you know, certainly calcium supplementation will put you at an increased risk because um, if if you have more calcium running through your urinary tract, now you don't really know that unless you have what's called a twenty four hour urine, where we collect the urine and measure the calcium and all that sort of stuff. But I think that's um, that's very a good question. Yes. My daughter was born with one kidney. Is there anything special that that we need to be doing to keep an eye on that one kidney? Because so you know, I said I mentioned just a minute ago that one of the things that Turner girls get is absence of one kidney, yeah. and so that is you know again one kidney. You can live a long, healthy, happy life and have no problems. There are some um, there are some things that are called hyperfiltration injury, which means if you've only got one kidney, that kidney has to do the work of two, so it filters more blood than it would if there were two kidneys. And so, the more filtration, there have been uh, proposals that that can lead to kidney damage long term. I mean, I'm talking years and years and years, but. You know, as long as you are are um, having good primary care, and they're checking all your, you know, they're checking your blood periodically, they're checking your blood pressure, they're checking all the things that primary care does, then it's going to show up if you have a, a kidney problem. So I don't having one kidney is not a reason to have anything special done, as long as you're not having problems. Correct. Okay. okay, good. That's good. I like questions. Um, one thing that um, the literature is somewhat vague about, but it's mentioned a lot, is the higher incidence of kidney and urothelial tumors, kidney, ureter, bladder cancer in adults. So, again, the only thing that I would say that you need to think of about that, kidney... Ureter, bladder, bladder tumors show up as anybody know what your symptom, primary symptom is? I would say hematuria. No, blood in the urine. So hematuria, blood in the urine, is the number one re, uh, symptom of a kidney tumor. So if you have ever have any blood in the urine, you absolutely need to get that checked out. But that I'm talking adulthood. I'm talking. I'm not talking kids. I'm talking uh, in on into adulthood. Um, and then, um, you know, like I said, 60% of folks never, ever, ever have a problem. So um, the reason we're talking about that is just to sort of let you know what the possibilities are and what to keep in mind, but to remember that most of the time you don't have a problem whatsoever. Renal agenesis, uh, we just talked about um, solitary kidney, one kidney. Uh, just have to take care of it, have to protect it, be aware that you've only got one kidney, and if you ever have any problems, get it evaluated immediately. Yearly bl- blood pressure, urinalysis, um, primary care. Does this include people who are getting the kidneys or um, some member of somebody else's transplant? It's what now? Does this include people who are given the kidney as a transplant, who are like the donor? The donor has... One kidney. donor has one kidney, yeah, yeah. If you, have, if you only have one kidney, you want to make sure you get yearly checkups for everything. Yeah. No different from anybody else with one kidney. So bladder and urethra typically are normal in folks with Turner syndrome. Um, and so uh, not really anything to talk about here. Um, anything that you have 
Uh, bladder urethra-wise is just normal urology that is part of being a person, not a person with Turner syndrome necessarily. So that's pretty much all there is to say about the urinary tract. So are there any other questions about that? Because it's pretty straightforward and pretty simple. If you have UTIs, you've got to be evaluated. Um, most of the time, as a baby or an infant, if you're diagnosed with Turner syndrome, you will have an ultrasound of the kidneys. You'll identify horseshoe or duplicated or absent kidney. So you sort of know what to look for going forward. But the bottom line is, um, if you have symptoms, you need to be evaluated. If you don't, you're fine. Yes? Malrotation is what? Same thing. Mal the question was, is there any, uh, what do you look for anything different with malrotation? And, you know, actually, all of this is a spectrum. So a horseshoe kidney is along the spectrum of a malrotated kidney. Malrotated kidneys just didn't fuse, and so they, they might have tried to fuse, but it's all sort of part of the same anomaly. Um, Going to have a higher risk for uh, reflux, obstruction, urinary tract infections, but nothing else to do just spe specifically for that. No. Or is this something we follow up with? No, not unless she has a problem. So, A, reflux will go away usually. It will resolve spontaneously. So the little kids have it as they grow up. Um, a lot of times it just spontaneously resolves. We don't have to do anything for it. Uh, the second thing is that, um, remember, reflux itself does not hurt a thing. It's the infection that occurs as a result of the reflux that causes damage to the kidney. So if she's not having UTIs, you're okay. Even if she still has reflux. I don't care if she still has reflux, as long as she's not having UTIs. Yes? I have two questions. Does the lymphatic system work in conjunction with this? I had a theory. It's probably wrong. But when somebody fully relaxes, their lymphatic system drains and it gets filtered by the kidney. Well, the lymphatic system is just another fluid management process that your body has. So when the lymphatic system drains, it, it, the, that fluid is reabsorbed by your bloodstream, which is then filtered through the kidneys, and the kidneys get rid of that fluid um, appropriately. So, I mean, they all kind of work in, conjection, or in connection with just for fluid management of your body. Probably not. Probably not. I mean, you know, the, I mean, I'll back up. One of the theories of some of the, the malformations that Turner folks have is from lymphatic swelling. So if you read about it and you're like, okay, why, does my, why is my aorta abnormal? Well, during development, there are some theories that it was lymphatic related. There was more fluid, more lymph, more whatnot around, and so that may have affected the development. Um, but, I mean, once born, once, you know, uh, it, it's, it all kind of works together, and there's really, it's just because you have potentially abnormal lymphatics doesn't mean you're going to have anything else. Right, right. Um, so that would be for the nephrology lecture. Okay. <laughs> no, no, but, but, no, no, but to answer your question, 
generally speaking, um, you know, the question, proteinuria indicates abnormal filtration of the kidney. And so there are a gazillion different reasons for abnormal fin- filtration of the kidney. The part that sort of falls over into my sort of structural anatomic world is reflux infection, damage of the kidney from obstruction, from infection, um, and from those type of things. So if we see a kid with proteinuria, the first thing we think about is, okay, what's going on in the kidneys? Is something wrong with the kidney? Sometimes not. Sometimes, you know, if they have a history of UTIs or reflux, then that would, you know, they would, I would probably need to fix that surgically. But the nephrologist is sort of the one that can go down that path of all the zillion of reasons that have proteinuria. And so sometimes they don't do anything. They just watch it, depending on what the other blood work looks like. Other times they may biopsy the kidney. Other times they may find reflux or hydronephrosis or one of those things and send them to see me. But it's, that's really, that, that falls in the realm of the nephrologist. What's that? <laughs> oh, yeah, you may, yeah, 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 that's right. Okay. Um, any other questions about kidneys? Yes. Uh, you're a pediatric urologist, right? Correct. Um, the kid, and we have trained many recently to get a surgery. Yes. What are some of the structural differences that they might indicate? Like Day or night? Nighttime? Nighttime. Zero. Zero. That nighttime, nighttime wedding is more of a sleep issue, not an anatomic structural issue. They typically are such heavy sleepers that they don't wake up when they have to go to the bathroom. And that's something that they outgrow, outgrow and that's more of a, a population problem, not a Turner problem. Okay, so moving on to the genitoreproductive area. Um, again, I'm more of the structural anatomic person. I will... I will say right away that I am not an endocrinologist and I am not an infertility specialist. But we're going to touch on some of that stuff, and if you have questions about specifics, I may bail on answering your question. But I'm just going to go over some of the, sort of the general things as they relate to... Yes? Oh, you are? Perfect. Perfect. Then there you go. There you go. So, so if I say anything wrong here, please... Let me know, okay? <laughs> but that's, all, that's awesome. That's actually who, right? That's exactly who we need. Um, so genital reproductive, ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, vagina, and then we'll talk some about reproductive potential. Um, ovaries, are they normal? No. And I think that's the, the primary issue here. Now, um, the, uh, the 45X karyotype basically does not have the biologic to potential to produce normal ovaries. Do they work? Rarely. And I will say rarely because in the rare case of someone with a mosaic karyotype who's got some 46XX material in their cells, we can see spontaneous um, hormone production, um, but again, it's very rare. So that's not something that you can expect. Um, And are there risks to these ovaries that don't work? And Um, I'll say yes, and we'll talk about that a little further. So typically, what we see in patients with Turner syndrome are what we call streak gonads. And that's just, that's I don't know where that name came from, but it's basically the ovaries are small, white, fibrous streaks of tissue. So they never developed into true productive ovaries. They're just small, little small, white streaks of tissue. And this is a pretty good example right here. It's just kind of yellow, uh, kind of a streak because it's long. Um, You see a smaller one here. Um, And most of the time those aren't going to cause a problem and we don't do anything about them. Um, But um, sort of still talking about do they work, um, typically um, ovarian failure occurs early on. Um, 
there are some egg producing cells um, that have been found in younger children, but by the time um, the, the, the girls reach 10, 12 years of age, um, the egg producing cells are typically gone. Uh, there's minimal hormone production and uh, secondary sexual characteristics rarely develop. Um, and that is a minimal, if any, axillary or pubic care, minimal breast development, and under, underdeveloped genitals. Um, the, big, the other thing, and what actually brings a lot of girls to diagnosis, is when they reach the age of puberty, they don't have a period. And so that's what we call primary amenorrhea, or no period, and that's what then stems the workup, and oftentimes the Turner diagnosis is made at that point. Um, however, since you can never say always or never, 16% of the girls will have spontaneous menses um, from some of that um, hormone production that we talked about. This is more um, common in those mosaic, 46XX mosaic Turner kids. Um, spontaneous puberty can occur. Um, Non-streak gonads can occur, again, more in the mosaic um, kids, spontaneous menses we uh, talked about. And then pregnancy, what is the situation with pregnancy? And we'll talk about that in a minute, or unless you want to talk about it. <laughs> I'm, you got me, you, you, I'm intimidated now because I'm just, I'm just a urologist. <laughs> so I'm fine, I'm fine. So um, when we talk about the ovaries, we really are talking about cancer risk because street gonads are... Uh, have, are known to form what we call gonadoblastoma, which is a malignant germ cell tumor of the testicle, or I mean of the, of the ovary. Are they getting that on the other? What's that? I didn't get that. They were facing the other way. Oh, no, no, I said testicle, okay. and I, I meant ovary. Um, street gonads um, are, are, will, can form what we call gonadoblastoma, which is a germ cell tumor of the ovary, which is, can be malignant. And so, again, that's not rare. I mean, it is rare. And in the pure 45X and the 45XX girls, um, we don't worry about the street gonads. We don't need to remove them. We don't need to do anything with them. They're going to be fine. Where we do have a significant risk is in what's called the Y-mosaic girls. And some of those girls will actually have some Y chromosome in their cellular makeup. Those girls are at risk for gonadoblastoma. Twelve um, percent may not sound very high, but when it's you, it's pretty high. And since the ovaries are typical, or the street gonads are typically not doing anything for you, we recommend that they be removed if you have the XY mosaic chromosome pattern. Um, the gonadoblastoma can occur early, as early as 10 months of age, and so uh, timely removal of the gonads is recommended. We like to take them out as soon as we can um, if in this very small subset of patients. Um, the gonads are removed laparoscopically, which means we do it through a camera in the belly button to working little small incisions of working ports. Most of you know probably what laparoscopic surgery is. But it's, it's an outpatient procedure. You go home the same day, and the risks are, are very minimal. Any questions about the ovaries? Yes? So my daughter has the grade 2 mosaic, and she was diagnosed with Turner two months ago. Her ovaries were big on the 6th, and it started to form germ cells in them. And she's also weak. Do you recommend... Um, I mean, I think at that age, um, you know, it, it's what? Our urologist that did her surgery is actually like kind of researching full body imaging. Yeah, I mean, me personally, I would do full body imaging to have a baseline to make sure that nothing is anywhere else. And if there's ever a question in the future, then we have a baseline study to compare to. Now, 
are, are the likelihood of finding anything, the likelihood of these metastasizing is pretty low. And so I don't think, you know, I don't think that you would um, necessarily miss anything, but I would typically like to have a, at least a baseline CT of the chest, CT of the abdomen. But don't tell your urologist if he says That's no. What we've okay, okay, good. Good, 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 good. I'm, I'm glad. Um, any other ovary questions? Yes. And you're not a, you're you're. I'm a forty. I'm a forty-five X, and then my other, but my other X is some of my cells have another X, but it's idiosyncratic. But you had you needed estrogen replacement. Oh yeah. Yeah, and are they talking? I mean, here we go. This may be a better question for her. They're streak ovaries. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, my understanding is that at a uh, so you're still taking estrogen. Yes, over his dead body, but I. Didn't yeah. Have because my understanding is at some point you, ta- you taper it off and, and stop the estrogen replacement therapy. I'm not aware of any higher risk in postmenopausal or perimenopausal women with ovarian tumors. This is really more of a, of a you know, if, you're, if, if you don't have any Y chromosome, this is really not a, a, a concern. That's what you, you resist. You resist. I mean, do you, do you have any, what's your name? Hey. Mary, yeah. do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, what, what's the recommendation now about hormonal therapy into the later? It's been debated for a while. It's been a decision. Yeah. And it's been different. And it's been a decision. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'll talk to her later, maybe because I can't see it. No, she said there's no risk. No risk. No risk. Yeah. Not to worry. No, that's great. That's great. It's education, right? Um, so, bottom line, take home point, point 45XY, gonads come out. Street gonads come out. Um, so, uterus um, is present, typically small, but potentially normal function. Um, Some of that depends on the timing of initial hormone replacement. Um, Pregnancy is debatable. Uh, It's certainly possible, uh, but the risks are significantly higher. Um, And uh, most girls will develop normal monthly periods with hormone replacement. Is that correct? Um, The vagina is normal with the exception of a very, very small subset of girls who have what's called Meyer-Rokitansky syndrome. Anybody ever heard of that? So that is actually a syndrome where the vagina does not develop. So there's, it's called it's vaginal agenesis. Um, and so in those rare situations, we will sometimes have to do vaginal replacement surgery. But for the vast majority... The vagina is normal, sexual function, pregnancy, and delivery are all pretty normal. Um, so here, you want to, here's where we can start talking together if you want to. Because I, cause I, I, they asked me to talk for an hour, and I was, after kidney and ovary, street gonad, I was pretty much at 20 minutes. So I thought I would talk a little bit about the re- re- reproductive uh, stuff just because I've, I've, I did some research on it and was pretty fascinated with the, with the, uh, with the breakthroughs that have happened in recent years. Um, vast majority um, are going to be primarily infertile. Uh, natural pregnancy can occur, but is typically in the mosaics. Um, adoption is obviously a... Um, a very real uh, possibility, and then there are some reports of surrogate carriers. Um, other options that have become increasingly, uh, uh, the opportunity is increasing, increasingly 
uh, occurring is that was in, uh, in vitro fertilization, either with donor eggs, which you get from a donor, you uh, fertilize them and then actually put them in the uterus and have the pregnancy till term. Um, rarely you can have IVF with your own eggs if that possibility exists, um, but you do have to know that the rate of miscarriages are high, and it's in the range of 50 to 60 percent actually. Even if you have, even if you're able to get pregnant, pregnant either naturally or with IVF, the rate of miscarriages is very high. Pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Come a long way. So one of the questions I would have for you is, at what age is the best time to to harvest the eggs for freezing? Because there, there was a lot, because we do, a, we do some of that for oncology patients. But this, as I was reading about all this, it's like this would seem to be a great opportunity for these patients as well. Yeah, and how and how do you um, determine whether they have eggs? So that that technology is pretty cool. Um, the um, and I think one thing that um, this is Mary kind of was talking about this um, uh, their own OS, uh, own eggs uh, they do better or they do better with donor eggs but still can do okay with their own eggs. Um, and we talked a little bit about egg retrieval because that's still a little controversial. You know, some people are suggesting retrieving oocytes from children, and um, I don't. That still may be not. I don't know. I, I mean, we've we've encountered some of that. Have you had any? Yeah. And we're doing that with testicular tissue as well. Yeah. So um, the um, the uh, again, it's good. the good news is there's a very low rate of fetal complications or birth defects if the baby makes it to term. We talked about the higher rate of miscarriage. Um, There is also a significantly higher rate of C-section required in women with Turner syndrome. Um, And pre-pregnancy counseling is imperative because uh, Mary alluded to it a little bit, but the mother is at fairly significant risk above the general population for pregnancy complications. Um, 
I mean, this, this, this statistic is very impressive to me. The mortality from pregnancy for a Turner female is 2%. That may not seem like a very big number, but look at that number in the general population. Yeah. It's just so much higher than average. Right, and that, that's, that's why that's here, because it's very, it's a significant risk. It is. And we have a live story here. How old are your kids now? Oh, my gosh, they're almost 26. Wow, that's awesome. Congratulations. That's, that's great. Um, liver disease, Dr. Russell talked about thyroid disease and diabetes a little earlier, uh, but, 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 uh, Turner women are at higher risk for pregnancy complications because of all these things. Um, so, I'm pretty much on time. You haven't, you have oh, did you wave the 15 minute? Okay. All right, well, I'm, I'm about done. Um, so, I mentioned earlier that most kids will get a renal ultrasound at the time of diagnosis just to assess the kidney and see if there are any abnormalities of the kidney. If the kidneys are normal, then you don't have to worry about any problems down the road. Remember the risk of UTI is higher due to reflux and obstruction. Surgery, if necessary, to correct the reflux or the UPJ obstruction. All of this is fixable once we find it, but it's finding it that's the key. Um, the karyotype 46, 45X, 46XY, it's in, uh, still recommended to remove the gonads due to cancer risk. Um, and it's important to know that pregnancy is possible, but counseling of the risks are mandatory before moving forward with any of this cool technology. So, thank you. And I'll uh, take questions. Yes. I have a question um, in terms of whether to see. So I, I mentioned my daughter had this hydrophenosis, and her pediatrician was going to talk to a urologist, and her endocrinologist was going to talk to a uh, nephrologist. So if it comes back and she, or she has UTIs and we need more testing, do I go to a nephrologist or a urologist? Urologist. UTIs, hydronephrosis, urologist. Okay. What is nephrologist? Problems with the kid, disease of the kid? Mm-hmm. Kidney? So, okay. so remember that picture of the, of the. So I take care of everything after the filter. So the kidney is, has millions and millions of little filters in it. And they're very, very complex, and, and that's what, that, what maintains all your electrolyte balances and all your fluid balance and everything. And so the actual working filtering mechanism of the kidney is the realm of a nephrologist. Anything after the kidney, the pelvis, the ureter, the bladder, the urethra, the structural part of the kidney itself is more urology. Yes, sir. This may be a question for Mary. With the reproductive, the risks, I'm guessing, go up with age. Reproductive risks go up with age, um, I would assume. He assumes. Yes. Yeah, so, it does. you know, if you're using your own egg, I know. who you are, reproductive risk will go up just because of the, the genetics of eggs become lesser as you get older. Um, and also, becoming pregnant, you have more risk as you get older. But uh, but the but the question would be: Are there is she still producing eggs? Is there a higher risk for ovarian failure from an egg production standpoint as you age? Definitely. Yeah. If it was medically appropriate, I'm safe. She 
this mosaic and this didn't know that it I heard yesterday, you know, she doesn't have any heart issues that we know of. That it's, she's very high risk at this age, but it's done or not. In some of these obsessions, there is maternal fetal medicine or MFM, and maybe three pregnancy counseling for all the So she, she for sure needs to be counseled on all the, not only the age risks, but all the overall risks as well. So that, that would, I think, be included in a counseling session with her GYN or maternal fetal medicine people. No, I know. That's 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 been pretty amazing to watch. I was married, and I was 25 when Louise born when Louise Brown was born. And but I mean, I was wondering if that two percent still included. You see, in my day, if I if my husband and I had decided to do in vitro, they would not have been that concerned with the heart at the time. Even though I am a Turner's growth hormone had not was not really going its thing in 1980, 1985. It was just be- the synthetic was just beginning, and so the money and interest in us. Well, I mean, the farm we, we weren't making anybody any money. They threw us some estrogen, some progesterone, and that's all anybody did. So they didn't know much. So does that two percent still include the women who were not evaluated cardiac uh, with cardi- for their cardiac situation? I don't know. That was just an article from 2015 that that I I got that, pre- but I, I didn't see how it broke down. Uh, It's extrapolated from the Marfan population. And a lot of this data is a little, is a little, because there's just not a lot of. I just wondered, my mother and my husband can do math, and I said two chances out of a hundred I was going to die. They would lock me in their room. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter's surgeon was pretty clear that it would just be entirely too dangerous for her to Yeah. Well, and I, and I think those are the kind of conversations that you have to have. And in this day and age of sort of modern tech, not modern technology, um, you know, it, it it's probably worth a conversation with an MFM, but yeah, the the risks are real. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is my ADR for her. I read something about a new. My daughter just got diagnosed like two months ago, so this is all new to us. And I read something about a woman saving her eggs for her daughter so that her daughter could use them in the future. Mm-hmm. And I was just wondering, like, what is your opinion of that, and how much does something like that cost? All right, so I'm a firm believer in staying on time. And so we're going to stop, wrap this up, but I'll be in the back if anybody has any questions, and I bet Mary will too. Even if you weren't, she is. I know, right? Well, she's, she's telling me what to do. 
Thank you.